Dr. Jeff Nam said is the official spokesperson really for the um, protest against the Northern Territory um, and the invasion of the Northern Territory. And I think that um, I just want to bring that up first because it's just one thing that if we could concentrate on to um, tell the government that um, all that it, it's just not right to ever ever allow people to have their basic rights taken away from them and to where they where they might want to shop or whatever. And I don't want to go into detail about it because all of you that are here probably care enough to come to some, some you know afternoon thing on, on a Saturday afternoon already. So um, I'll just hand over to, to Jeff and I hope he'll talk more about what we could do to actually um, get the government to see that that one thing, if we could just do that one thing is to stop that, that um, to, to stop the Northern Territory um, invasion would, would be the, the beginning of maybe having a treaty made well, on Gadigal land, I acknowledge all of their elders, and on this day, we really can look back to where the resistance started. It was an invasion, and the attempt by Aboriginal leaders and very every man, every woman, to resist what was so clearly wrong. The idea that the English sailed into the harbour and to the bay and saw no one is such an extraordinary legal fiction, we know, but it, it was a violent one. And so the resistance began not far from where we are and it's connected all the way through to the event that Elaine is talking about, an ongoing invasion of the homes, communities and lands of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. And around the country, the similar federal and state and territory invasion of their lawful rights on the southern fronts. So the resistance really begins, the spirit of that was, I think as Vincent Lingiari explained, it is all about the land, not ownership of the land, but in the view of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as Rosalie Cuneth Monks from Utopia puts it so beautifully, she would say, the land holds us all. And so the idea that you could be dispossessed of the mother, dispossessed of 65,000 years or more of heritage, of your own languages, uh, of your birthright, uh, is so astonishing, so improbable, but really so damaging from then to now, it's connected. There is really not any break in the relentlessness of the dispossession, the oppressiveness, and the denial of those rights. And so before Elaine ever came to this country with her mind full of the global story, there were actually Aboriginal people from here going out and challenging from the day Cook sailed in here, uh, and then in the decades that followed, there was the Pemelways, Windrines, the, all of the warriors who stood up across the country were resisting, and they resisted a very brutal massacre. The frontier wars, as Henry Reverend describes, those slaughters of a minimum of 20,000 people slaughtered at that time. The resistance continued through that first century and uh, into the 1800s. Aboriginal people uh, like Ben Long had gone out and back to England and was looking at who are these people that had come here to take everything that they could. Uh, there were people like uh, Anthony Martin Fernandez who uh, saw the murder of two people uh, he had an Aboriginal mother and he saw the murder of two people and wanted to be a witness to bring justice to that event, which is also part of the resistance. How do we use even an imposed legal system to resist? But he was not allowed to be a witness in the courtroom of the oppressor. So disgusted, he went overseas, 
His name is a little uncertain, but the stories are not, because eventually, after a long journey, he ends up in front of an English judge. And there he is eyeballing the oppressor and saying, you will not speak to me like that because I know what your people are doing to my people. And his uh, crime was pulling a pistol and pointing at someone as he sold, um, he was a tinker, so he sold toys and things and would often parade wearing a long coat with little skeletons and other things that were really his motifs for what the oppressor was doing here, which was a genocide. It was the unfolding of a genocide, that first century of slaughter. So in the courtroom, there was resistance, eloquent resistance, resistance that centuries, a century later, Michael Kirby would mention in the High Court and in speeches and say these people are part of trying to awaken a global sense of horror and to recognise the slaughter that was happening here. So it is connected and it is unbroken. And then you roll into about the era that our parents were alive. My mother was born in 1916 was watching the continuing oppression in the lower parts of the Hunter Valley. And at that time, in the 20s and 30s, there were new uh, incarnations of resistance. There were attempts to form Aboriginal organisations that resist oppression and attempted to establish through courts, through all of the tactics of resistance, some semblance of justice for Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people. It was reminding everyone that land rights was the essence of being able to hang on to land, culture, language, that so much was bound up with the ongoing dispossession. But the generation that you were photographing, which included all of those people, um, were watching on American television, if they had not ever left the country, they were seeing the civil rights marches, and they were seeing the American Indian movement. So the Dennis Leans and Russell Banks are Native Americans and Navajo young lawyers who were leading the American Indian movement had brothers and sisters here who were educated and tactically quite brilliant and had their own Australian-grown sense of both universal struggle because that had come from Marcus Garvey out of the Caribbean to the United States with the American seamen, African-American seamen came here and the contact with Australians working on the docks was an important part of the sharing of the idea of universal justice, rights and resistance. So there was uh, a lot of empathy and when Charles Perkins organised with students from across the road uh, the Freedom Rides, tactically it was a, a homegrown style of the American Freedom Rides, but with a very different gateway, the places they went, to the swimming pools or the theatres. It was not copying all of this knowledge of resistance. It is universal. It's, whether it's Martin Luther King, or Gandhi, or Thoreau sitting on Walden Pond, or Nelson Mandela in a different era locked up on Robben Island, the idea is that we are a human family. And Aboriginal people were very strong on that, that there was this brotherhood and sisterhood of universal kinship with resistance in other places. And I, I think the clearest example, perhaps, was William Cooper, uh, going into the German consulate in Melbourne and saying, you cannot slaughter these people. These people were the Jews after Christenach, and making it clear that this was a human response. So he was a man who wasn't recognised in his own country as a citizen, protesting about the slaughter of his fellow human being. So that kinship is very much... Uh, in where you look at what we would say was an Afro hairstyle that someone like 
uh, young Gary Foley, occasionally the hair, you'll see many of the, of the guys that were my age in the streets, uh, who are all now 70-ish uh, <laughs> and old, uh, were empathising in the way people do now if they want to use the rap song as an expression of injustice or Black Lives Matter. They matter here, they matter in South Africa, or and they matter in the streets of the United States. So all that, you do, you, you were catch, capturing that. But I think what you did, Eli, it's not just turning up. You saw the importance, and you may not have known where it was going to go. But when you went to the Ted Embassy, for example, um, what are your own memories of? I know many of those fellows, except Michael Anderson, have gone. And John Newfong, I knew, was, was one of the first truly eloquent Aboriginal journalists. He was probably the pioneer that went into the mainstream newspaper world. But on the, at the Ted Embassy, then, the guy was brilliant. He was uh, a gifted orator, writer, and he fed lines of power to people like Charles Man to Ch uh, Charlie Perkins. Uh, the Charlie Perkins uh, gift was unquestionably original and brilliant, but he also brought out the best in other people like John. I thought the way they worked together. Yeah. So what were your memories of some of the characters at the Ten Embassy? They were very young. Well, I think um, Bobby Sykes, uh, Dr. Roberta Sykes was the one that introduced me to Mum Cheryl. And if you don't, Mum Cheryl is um, Shirley Smith. And she adopted 250 kids, literally, brought them home from the courts. And maybe 50 of those kids were white, too. She wasn't, she wasn't a racist. And she took care of them, got these women who fostered them and took care of them. And, lived over a church, you know, in the Presbyterian Red Room with the kids, and I became involved with, um, you know, raising money to help with the kids and different things, but I remember Chicka Dixon was very verbal, um, and became a leader in New South Wales, and we mustn't forget Chicka. The work that he did was just unbelievable. If you have a chance to um, uh, ever hear his, his whole family, there. They sing and they, they, they even do rap now, some of them, and um, getting degrees, master's degrees. And the family is such a strong family because Chica was such a strong person to, you know, to, to start a club on Friday night down here on the street in Sydney where Aboriginal people, young people could come and see each other. And, at a time where they used to have curfew, Aboriginal people weren't, weren't allowed on the street after a certain time. And, you know, he, he broke the ice. Um, yeah, I can't, I'm trying to think who else. I think Charles Perkins was, was, was wonderful to the way he organized. And we mustn't forget Joe Croft, he was his right hand man. That behind the scenes, that did a lot of things. I think I should also acknowledge this is my husband here, Gordon Siren. And, um, head of the keeping place uh, of our Aboriginal artists that certainly has taken up a lot of our time and took away from my own photography career that I, I, I didn't really market myself. <laughs> a lot of people don't know my work very much, but um, it's because I um, got involved with this group of artists and I certainly photographed all their work, you know, and documented um, that. And I, I'm, I'm proud of Gordon's um, paintings, so he has consistently painted political paintings um, um, to, to prove that, that um, coming through the heads out there, you know, the Invasion Day, and they're at the um, Museum of Sydney, um, he's painted that one scene of the ships coming through the heads over 250 times. <laughs> I'd like to have an exhibition sometime with all the different colors and the different <laughs> And skies and showing how many times he painted it because he was so angry about it somehow. And, not, and also to not let the Australian people forget that, that history which you talked about in the beginning too. And um, So you photographed also the 
a prelude to the 1967 referendum, and some of your photographs actually catch the, the placards that I know that was probably the first time as a very young Green reporter yeah. that I was both in the streets but also looking at the vote. What are we voting for here? And, and my memory was that we were voting for like a, a universal recognition of the past injustice and recognising uh, an equality. And as the slogan said, vote yes for Aborigines, there was a simplicity about it that was now looking back naive because it had no true understanding of how treacherous the political process that would swallow it up and really sit and do nothing from 1967 to now. Legally, we haven't really got out of where we were pinned in 1967, but in the streets, uh, all of the, the banners about land and 200 years of white lies, or we all walk on Aboriginal land, uh, land rights, not bullets. The, the clear focus of the resistance actually was prescient. There was an understanding, I think, instinctively, the people who were in the streets knew uh, this was acknowledgement, but it was pretty hard because each time something would happen that a bit of hope would be held out, a hand of friendship would be held out by the government. Um, it seemed that there was the treachery just around the corner. So from the 1967 hopefulness, uh, very soon in the federal political leadership, there was a total retreat. You can hear former prime ministers try to explain why, why we didn't get to a treaty, why land rights was not delivered. Uh, the courts went on into Mabo because of Eddie Mabo not because the government was an enlightened response. Eddie Mabo and the whole northern resistance is another marvellous story. The South Sea Island resistance to the slaughter and the death of their people, the unnecessary deaths of thousands of South Sea Islanders brought here as indentured labour or slaves uh, was another part of the story from that time that questioned the way the government was presenting to the nation a story of uh, now we are reconciled, you know, now you have, we're returning land. So Gough Whitlam, yes, he ran some sand through his hand with Vincent McGiari, but we connect to the 21st century and what is still happening, the federal government controls to this day the lives of the people in 73 of the Northern Territory communities. The wealth of their lands does not benefit them in their well-being. And so I think a lot of the, the, the clear-minded people all the way back to the 1960s knew they were dealing with treachery. And yet it's incredible and your photographs kept, capture the spirit of people that were never bitter about that uh, for all of the fierceness of what went on right here on some of these same streets. Uh, the police at times were very brutal. Uh, did, did you see yeah, that yourself? I, I have many with, memories. I read it and, and, and saw police brutality and resistance. Kicking, and, bashing, dragging uh, people in. <clears throat> I was chased by the police even because I was trying to take photos. <laughs> but, you know, I, I must make something clear. I came after the referendum. I came yes. in the 71. Mm -hmm. And um, I was 25 years old when I came, so um, I, I missed out on the referendum, but I heard about it, and only maybe even after I was here for a few years, it wasn't in the history book. I've kept my history books, yeah. what I used, and... Um, so you arrived with so, fresh eyes, then you were seeing this. Yes, and, and, but I... The first protest that I went to was at New South Wales Parliament House, and my students at Randwick Girls High School actually said to me, um, what, would you come, miss, and, and see what's going on, and then you'll understand. So I went, I didn't take a camera, because I thought the TV cameras would be there, the top, you know, news TV. There wasn't one TV camera there. There must have been a hundred people 
Set old people with signs and everything, sent, very polite, didn't go in the road, on bus, the one side, and then in truck, all in truck. And the police were everywhere. And I said, well, where's the cameras? So that's why I went home to get my camera. And, and, and when I came back, they were all walking away. But then I found the Aboriginal Legal Service. I've made it my business. I went and talked to people, and Jenny Monroe and Isabel Coe were the head of the children's service. Um, it was in an old factory with mattresses. It was ugly and dirty and filthy. Um, you know, the Phillips family was there, and, and Tony Mundine was trying to set up the gym, and, um, and I, I had all my cameras stolen one time on the Everly Street. I just had a baby, and um, I went into Murrowina Child Care Center, and I parked my car right in front, and I took the baby, and I locked my car, and I ran in, and I handed it to one of the older lady I knew, and then I ran straight back to my car. My window was broken. They took my purse and my camera bag and took off. And I just ran out straight. I didn't even, it was gone. <clears throat> and um, I won't tell you how, how it all ended, but <laughs> it wasn't very nice. But um, what happened was from then on, Tony, um, Tony Mundine, said, okay, next time you come, anytime you want to come, you just call up. And they used to let me drive my car in underneath the, the, where the gym was, and uh, before that was before the black market. And, uh, and then he said, uh, one of my brothers will walk around with you so you're safe with your cameras, and they're very polite, you know. And I think one thing I'd like to say is that a lot of people, and especially what I would hear, if I talk, if I ask anybody about it in those days, this is the 70s, they would say <laughs> that everybody's just drunk. They, the, the stereotyping was just so ugly. And then I, I wanted to prove that there were people sitting behind typewriters. And, you know, the computers came later. <laughs> but the, the, at the Aboriginal Legal Service, there were people, uh, uh, white lawyers that had, there was before Paul Coe even became a lawyer, and, and Bob Lear, they were studying. Um, and, and Pat O'Shane had just come in as the Aboriginal affair, right up here, that's Pat, and, and her daughter is Lydia Miller, the head of the Aboriginal Arts Board. So all these people, they were, they were achieving, but nobody knew about it. Essie Coffey and Brett Warner, all these people, they didn't, nobody knew about them because nobody cared to put it in the news. It wasn't news. The only news was if somebody hurt somebody or were, if there was violence, that's what they wanted to show, the news people. It was ugly. And Gordon, you, what Michael Kirby called the most powerful political painting in this country, you painted that when you, in judgment by his peers, this painting has an Aboriginal, a black face as the judge, all black faces in the jury, and the white fellows in the dock. And to, it, it's probably another magnificent example of sometimes how the art, the photograph, or the painting, or the film, or the dance, cuts through when we don't see it, when we stop feeling it, we're numb to how this has gone on for over two centuries. So when you started painting <coughs> this story, um, where did that come out of, uh, you know, as Elaine said, you went over and over the first invasion, the ships through the Sydney Heads, the, the Kame, all of the, the camping around the bay, all the way through to what happened in the court. Because I grew up, I grew up on thousands of acres of land, and uh, my father worked, and we had to work hard for the kids growing up, you know, and, uh, and, and when, when we got up uh, later on in life, uh, and certain people died off, uh, I hate to be a racist, but the white fellow married into my, to my auntie, and, uh, and then other people came in, and, uh, and another fellow got the land, thousands of acres, so <clears throat> I suppose it was a bit crazy, but I, I got my gun and said, well, I'm not going to put up with it, you know. And I went and 
fix the problem up in 1972. And, and uh, as a result of that, I, I got uh, sentenced to a life sentence. And, uh, uh, and I didn't get out of prison until 1982, 1972. Judge by Spears at court, you know what I'm saying? And when I arrived in court, I was really shell shocked and shocked. Because, you know, after things I went went through, you know, I'd never been in trouble with the police. I was a public servant before that. And when this all blew up, uh, my life was a bit of a mess. And, and uh, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, I forget what I was going to you say. Had, you hadn't painted before that time. I hadn't painted. No, no. I was uh, worked as an electrician, and, uh, uh, and I finished up in prison with a with a life sentence. And I've seen fellows doing business. But it kept ringing in my head about judgment by his peers, about being judged by your peers, and your peers are your equals. And I said, well, I'm a darky, you know, I didn't see the darkies on that jury, but uh, people let me know I was a, I was a darky or an evo. Uh, they didn't tell me that too much when I was growing up because <clears throat> I'd learned out of box. And, and if somebody wanted to give me a hard time, well, they didn't. And I had seven or eight brothers, and, all sorts of things, and had all sorts of protection, but, uh, but it, 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 it is. But that was my get back judgment by its peers. I went into court and I thought, well, where are my peers? Uh, none of my peers. They wouldn't do it to me now, because they've done it to me now. The judge would have to gag me because I wouldn't shut up. I'd tell him off. Uh, and, uh, but, so I painted Judge by his peers, and I made everyone in that court in black, except the man on trial, and made him a white, white fella, and called it Judgment by his peers, because that's what happens to Aboriginal people. If you don't believe me, in 1972, I was in Long Bay Jail, one of the jobs I'd done out there, I worked in reception. And, uh, and years and years ago, <coughs> the guy, the, the prison officer in charge of the reception room used to pick up the book from that bar. And he even knew the fella that I went and shot. Can I say uh, the reason, one reason that it happened was that Aboriginal people in, in 72 and in the 60s, they weren't allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to vote or... If they they weren't. Can, the fella, so, the person that, that owned the south of the of land was a cripple fella. But he was a bookkeeper, he was crippled, he couldn't work except he had to sit on his fat ass and do paperwork. And, uh, he uh, married, married to my father's sister, and uh, his name was Bob too. And one Bob says to the other, Bob, Bob, I've got a deposit for land. I'll put a deposit on it if you give me your, 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 your boys his work. And we worked, we worked it for years because Aboriginal people weren't allowed to own land. We worked it for years, and then. <clears throat> A prostitute came along, and she bought a son. That's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're being edited here. <laughs> well, so, but, I, but, I but, think Mama Jericho. I think Mama Jericho. That's right. Yeah. What, so. what you went through uh, in prison uh, was very familiar to you. You, you also focused on the issue of deaths in custody, brutality in custody, uh, lack of justice on the way to incarceration. And that's in much of your photographs. So what was your contact with the Aboriginal prison population? How did that start? Yeah, I, I think I saw Paul Cove and uh, Bob Lear and at the Aboriginal Legal Service, Lyle Monroe, um, Lyle was so vociferous, um, took up where <laughs> Paul Code spoke a lot at first, but Lyle became more um, verbal later and took, took up a role of what uh, Rebecca Raymond calls indigenous resistance here. <laughs> um, and and um, I, I heard horrible stories about what was happening in the country. and. Um, and I say in the country, in the, in the bush, where white men were not charged for slaughtering or massacring even huge numbers of people and, and hiding it and getting away with it. And the older people that I 
met in, in Redfern up on the top of the Aboriginal Medical Service, the older women would meet up there. And um, the women that ran uh, Murrawina Child Care Center, Mrs. Ingram and Mrs. Bostock and Mrs. Uh, Merritt, um, Bobby Merritt's um, mother, and Bobby Merritt wrote the first, um, the, the Cake Man, one of the first plays. Uh, uh, I think that, that, was, that generation of people were just remarkable because of their stories. And I wish sometimes that I ha had, a, had a, you know, like I listened to the stories about prison and what had happened. They were bashed in prison and got away with it. Or, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I just wish I could have been a filmmaker <laughs> and I could sh share the stories with you. You wouldn't have got in prison with your camera. It was a close world, wasn't it? Squishing the tires would have stopped you quick. <laughs> Royal Commission yeah. took place and then they just ignored it. Mm. You know, Honourable Michael Kirby said he's going to come by here, a cameo. <laughs> he might drop in, so he might, he might come. <clears throat> we'll see. I think that um, that he heard the stories, and I think he cares. And there are people on the high court, and have been in the high court, and are judges, and are educated. I'm even remembering Brian Long, who's a magistrate, Justice. that asked to go to Dubbo, and asked to go to Broken Hill, and was at Maureen to inherit it. There are a lot of lawyers now and, and judges and people that do care. And there is a movement now to respect Aboriginal people and to respect land rights. And I, I, I believe, I, I want to look to the future now that that's going to happen. I, and there'll be, what do you think about a treaty? What, what does everybody here think it, about it? It, 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 it? There is a difference being made. Go out to the prisons and see how many Aboriginals in the prisons, see how many people in charge of the books. It's certainly true, as you say, Gordon, that by any way you want to measure injustice, it continues. And what you're describing, Elaine, is the, the collaboration that has always occurred. From the beginning, there were some non-Indigenous people who were brothers and sisters. When you go to the Northern Territory, people still remember those that came and camped and drove food into the longest strike in Australian history. In Western Australia, they talk the same. Uh, there's deep memory of shared resistance, whether it has stopped the oppression uh, and what is the best way to resist in the 21st century. There's widespread views about it, but unquestionably, incarceration, poverty, suicides, the poor health, unnecessary death, uh, horrendous injustices where the court system does not deliver the same justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That pattern hasn't changed. The attempts to dispossess and deny and assimilate is the juggernaut that keeps rolling on. To see these images, uh, you know, I could point at any, any image and say, well, this happened then, and I remember that. And sometimes seeing those images, I could say, I was there. And um, mm. Elaine's work really captures that, that expression, that moment in time. And uh, I think that's a very, very um, unique gift uh, because, you know, like Jet said, you, you don't come from our country but you, you came here and, and connected and saw that uh, injustice and uh, documented it beautifully. Anyone well done, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and of course, someone else like Sabine sitting here very quietly taking us all in and her husband, Brumley, uh, who came 
and saw it with an open mind and an honest response. Uh, and Sabine and Bromley have, in their own way, contributed to the resistance to ongoing injustices in organising events around the Northern Territory intervention and protests and a dozen other major uh, issues that I, that I know of that you've been involved in. But to you, for you, was, was seeing the work of Barbara and Elaine, the storytellers, part of what filled in for you the history of how we got into this mess of the what, what did you make of uh, the work when you started to see this history of oppression and resistance? I loved the photos, definitely, for sure. I, I, I love taking photos, but I can't capture them so eloquently as, you know, Barbara or Elaine. So it's great to see that there's so many people able to yeah, take so many wonderful pictures. And you must have learned, as an outsider looking in, how hard it would be to get the truthful image into the mainstream media that so many events that you organise with Aboriginal people, where you feel the, the great silence just rolls over the top of the yeah, things as if they're still true. looking through them. That's true. Yes. The great silence. Mm. Did you feel that? Oh yeah, uh, and also um, I only started taking photos in the beginning and then um, I went to your college to uh, to take the Diploma Government Studies degree there. And uh, one of my teachers said he knew that I was going to all these different events and we were um, organizing events about the intervention mostly. And he said to me, why don't you film it and not just take photos? And so that's when I started to also get a camera and videotape and then put it up on the website so that we can spread the word and uh, just so it was very important because it doesn't get really in the mainstream news. So this was the tradition that people like Gary Foley instinctively took up back in the 60s, that he even watched Russell Lins and Dennis Banks, the American Indian Union lawyers, who uh, organised the storming of the trading post at Wyndham Knee, South Dakota. Another man climbed uh, a statue. Uh, and it was to capture attention was very difficult. Of course, if Redfern rioted or Palm Island rioted, later decades, that would be, as you said, the violence would be on the front page. But to actually capture the voice, the, the message, uh, the, the really intimate stories of loss and pain and what was happening as a result of oppression was very difficult to get in. And I think that that is why black theatre was so important yeah. and political. And it was way ahead of, of the the whitewash version of reality. And so those same people from that era, the 70s when you arrived, and very importantly, I think you both saw the beauty and strength of the cultural resistance. That, as I say, Bangara has done works that are truly political, yeah. magnificent, powerful expressions, yeah. and the the, the, the Ivan Sands and Warwick Thorntons in making uh, fictional stories are still capturing part of what's going on in Resistance. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lorna Munro's poems, I think you can see the, the, the inheritance of Resistance. Yeah. Uh, not Resistance as just a performance artifact of something saying, this is great. It was about, no, we haven't moved out of the, uh, the era, and the, the eloquence and artistic brilliance is a very powerful weapon. You know, Samson and Delilah can make people see what no amount of talk or written work will do. It makes them see the two worlds you know, of, of people who really are the oppressors, ignoring people that they have oppressed and dispossessed, all in a look. Uh, those movies, uh, I think, and, and all of the documentary filmmakers, when you said you began to put your work as Sabine and Rummy did, the social media uh, era of resistance and of sharing the truth. If you think now with examples like Miss Dooms, the injustice over Miss Doom, that 
travels probably more effectively through social media than it does still on the mass media. Yeah. So uh, those that take the film uh, are as important as those that find the Larissa Berenz to go to Bar Barrowville uh, cases, to go to Mr. Dew's case, or Mr. Ward in Western Australia, all of those things. It's a combination of, can you fight it in the courts, like Anthony Martin Fernandez? Can you, uh, like Larissa Berenz, go all the way uh, legally? But can you also use the paintbrush, like Gordon, the camera, can you, can you put it into a Bangara performance? Or is it in your Ellie Cobby Eckerman poem? Sometimes it's a lone Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander voice. Or it may be as beautiful as the brother that we've just lost up in your own country. It makes everyone listen through the voice of, of and, and what he conveyed in terms of the attachment to place and country all that's deep, deep, deep in that, uh, back to the, what the Vincent Lingiari spoke about. I think all of those aspects really still are expressions of resistance at different times in what is a very, very long struggle. I think that uh, also, Jeff, uh, we should mention East Coast Encounter that you curated. I mean, to go all the way up to Cooktown and beyond, <laughs> And gather these people, artists, and well, that was, and the, that was one of the strongest yeah. moments was that lady that sang in language. Yeah, this is this is a, an interesting thing. We may be in the twenty first century, but do we know the story? Have we, as Gordon said, come to grips with the lie and the murder and the disposition? I don't know. The truth and nothing but because we have what they got. Huh? The truth, the truth hasn't been universal. Acknowledge, and so what East Coast Encounter was was a collaborative attempt by artists, Gordon, Aboriginal artists, Torres Strait Islander artists, Kiwis, and non-Indigenous Australians, a few poets, a couple of historians. Uh, I took a camera because no one else did. That was really why a film came out of it. I'm not a cinema photographer. I'm a journalist. But I knew someone should capture. And what they did was, everywhere that Cook went, from Kame all the way up to Possession Island, it was a search for what was the Aboriginal point of view about the dispossession. And the story you described, on uh, Fraser Island, the Bachelor people have a song that is now over two centuries old, that actually describes the spirit canoe moving like a sand crab. That English ship was the only one that came close enough in, and as you know, Cook soon after <coughs> runs aground on the Barrier Reef, the Endeavour gets hold on the Barrier Reef. So there was this magnificent story in the language uh, uh, which uh, Gemma Cronin, a linguist, a uh, modular linguist, was able to bring to life in the, exp uh, in the experience in a way that we were living and really from that point that everyone went and there were a lot of terrible things that happened on a, a point called Indian Point where Aboriginal people were herded over this cliff over the top and the artists, some of the artists travelled there. Uh, Gordon went to the bay where people were shot there when the, these English Marines first went ashore. So there was a, it wasn't just Cook's journals that were providing the, the structure. The contribution to the truth was that there is in fact a strong living oral history that very accurately describes things, including glorious mediations or reconciliations, some people might see it as, uh, where the endeavor was pulled up on the shore and Cook's men had taken too many turtles and the Gugu Yithama would have had every reason to kill them all, given how greedy this English crew were at that moment. But a wise old man led them out. The men put their spears uh, down on a pile and they took a few of the crew back to sit around the campfire. And in this process of wisdom, they conveyed that 
we could take you out, but we're not going to. It was a clever resistance. It was a Martin Luther King cunning at the same time as letting them know that they were on the country of the Gudi Yithma people. And in Cook's journal, there's an acknowledgement for the first time these are not a primitive, flimsy craft that he described as the canoes down here. Now he sees these people are navigators. They aren't holding their boats on the reef. And he describes uh, how there is no inequality of condition. He's a hard man from North England who sees that these people, as he puts it, are living at one with the land. So tragically, by that stage, he's ignored the king's orders. He has not negotiated. There is no treaty, and that's where we are today. Uh, the, the, the killing and the violence by the Marines on those four occasions became the pattern. So the invasion that was to come of many more ships and much bigger scale uh, really does go back to that contact of what was lost in translation and opportunity. Uh, but the, 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 the varied Aboriginal response to the oppression, and including the Torres Strait Islanders, uh, is very much connected to where we are today. So the further north you go, people will remind you all the time, there was no surrender. There was no agreement. We didn't ever say, this is yours to the king. Uh, so that's where we are in all of the discussion and recognition of rights and constitutional change. As Gordon says, we haven't fixed it. We're still really in a period of trying to establish the truth uh, or have people recognise the